a warm welcome to all the attendees today and my dear sirs um to yet another very new episode of our dear polaris talks i consider it calling dear is very important because it is becoming one of the most important part and parcel of all the medical students life who have been who has been attending since the last two weeks so i'm um, pretty happy that uh, we're getting a lot of good responses as well regarding the the topic of uh, general anatomy as well as the q and a's that we have been uh, discussing throughout so um, as informed today also we will be doing a session on um, general anatomy itself and uh, so for that we have our uh, respected uh, medical director of dr polaris dr ryan fernandez sir warm welcome to you how are you doing thank you aishwarya i'm fine am i audible all good there yes sir you're really audible no oh. worries oh, okay so uh, following ryan sir's class we'll also have a q and a discussion oh. from our dearest uh, dr sanjit bachpe chief academic um, officer at uh, dr polaris okay so in the last class we in the last module we discussed about the epithelial tissue uh, the epithelial cells that uh, line usually the lumen of the organs today we'll discuss about the connective tissue now what exactly is this connective tissue what exactly is this connective tissue so connective tissue is a tissue that fills the spaces between more specialized tissue so if you remember the uh, cells that were lining now for example any lumen of the uh, body uh, organs of the body like esophagus or stomach so these are the epithelial cells that we extensively discussed about and on the, uh, these epithelial cells lie in the uh, on the basement membrane it's like a foundation for the epithelial cells on which the cells lie and deep to this a uh, basement membrane lies the connective tissue and it is in this connective tissue that blood vessels and nerves run and the nature of this connective tissue varies in different parts of the body depending on the type of structures that it contains so what does it contain it contains fibers cells and ground substance so it uh, this um, connective tissue we'll have three component one is fibers second one is cells and third one is the ground substance depending on the quantity of fibers cells and the ground substance the nature of the connective tissue also varies so in uh, if you see the second image here you can see there are some groups of cords like a cord like structure so those are grouped fibers you can see some single fibers what what are called as the elastic fibers so they are the fibers in between these fibers you see some uh, cells that are interspersed so you can see a cell here a cell here and amidst all this this is all suspended it's like water in a bucket in which multiple uh, structures are thrown some thread is thrown those are the fibers some um, uh, jelly like material is thrown those are the cells so that is nothing but the connective tissue now if lot of thread is thrown into the uh, bucket of water that bucket of water the water is the ground substance if lot of thread is thrown that entire uh, water gets filled with lot of thread which becomes a tough structure instead of water uh, instead of the thread you throw lot of jelly like material which represents the cells so cells increase so based on the type of fiber or cells that is the constituent that is thrown into the ground substance the nature of the connective tissue varies in that it becomes if it is uh, containing more of cells like what is seen in the lamina propria now in the uh, esophagus the connective tissue area is called as the lamina propria it contains lot of cells on the other hand the connective tissue of the bone contains lot of fibers so it is harder so the connective tissue varies from structure to structure so if we want to group the connective tissue with their components it contains three components we already discussed fibers cells and intercellular ground substance these are further divided into the fibers are divided into three main types that is collagen fibers reticular fibers and elastic fibers we'll discuss each of these the cells are 
further divide into based on whether the cells are present within the connective tissue itself or cells which start from somewhere else, which originate from somewhere else and then come into the uh, connective tissue. So one group of cells are the residents of the connective tissue. The other groups of cells are the NRIs, which have come from somewhere else and then entered the connective tissue. And of course, the intercellular ground substance, the water, the water that is uh, present, uh, the water in which these fibers and cells are thrown into. So again, we go to the same, same image. You can see that there are fibers, there is a ground substance and there are cells. Now, if we, we went into the previous slide talking about fibers, different types of cells, and intercellular ground substance. Now you can see some cord-like structure here, ropes. Those become the collagen fibers, the fibers. Then you can see uh, some scribble lines. They become the uh, reticular fibers. Single lines become elastic fibers. And you can see a lot of cells. Um, uh, looks like a starfish here, what is called as a fibroblast. You can see plasma cells, macrophages, lymphocytes, um, uh, mast cells, adipose cells. All these together, all these different structures together, the fibers, the cells, and the intercellular ground substance together form the connective tissue. So this connective tissue usually lies deep to the epithelial cells and the basement membrane. So epithelial cells, basement membrane, connective tissue. Connective tissue contains fibers, cells and ground substance. The cells that they contain are numerous which can be the cells which are always present in the connective tissue and the cells which come from somewhere else and then enter into the connective tissue. Fibers as well as the ground substance. So this is the basic structure of the connective tissue. Now obviously next we have to study the individual components of the connective tissue. We know that there are collagen fibers. We know that there are fibers, cells, and ground substance. First, we'll concentrate on the three types of fibers that are there. That is the collagen fibers, reticular fibers, and elastic fibers. The first thing that should come to your mind when you think of collagen fiber is a rope. A rope which is not entangled. So these are the most abundant of all the fibers that are present in the ground substance. Uh, most abundant of the cells that are present in the ground substance, they are seen in bundles. So you can see there is one bundle of collagen fibers, another bundle of collagen fibers, and these bundles branch with and anastomose with adjacent bundles. But it is the bundles which branch and anastomose with the adjacent structure. You don't see a single fiber branching or anastomosing, unlike what we'll see later. So in collagen fibers, the entire bundle of fibers, they branch and anastomose with the adjacent collagen fibers. So they form, end up forming a mesh-like structure which gives strength to the structure. They appear white with the naked eye and they uh, stain uh, light pink with hematoxylin and eosin stains. So in this the diagrammatic representation, the rope-like structures become the collagen fibers. So these collagen fibers can stretch. They can, be, uh, depending on how much of pull, for example, in the muscles, they can really stretch. They can bend. They can even swell and become soft when they are exposed to weak acids and strong acids destroy them completely. And when collagen fibers are boiled, they are converted into gelatin. So the important features are Collagen fibers can stretch, they can bend, they swell and become soft when they're exposed to weak acids and alkalis. They get destroyed by strong acids and when they are boiled, they become gelatin. And from where do these collagen fibers come? So we need to remember later we'll be talking about the fibroblast. So all these collagen fibers are fibroblast cells. So that is why they produce uh, the fibroblast cells produce collagen fibers because of which it gets its name as the fibroblast, collagen fibers. Fibroblast produces collagen fibers, and that is why it is known as the fibroblast. So these fibroblasts first produce procollagen, which are three polypeptide chain, which are joined together, which in turn lead to the formation of tropocollagen, which when um, uh, released into the extracellular space, become collagen fibers. So this is all about the collagen fibers. 
next very important especially when we are talking about hernias when we talk about wound healing to understand the concept of the types of collagen so there are five types of collagen type 1 2 3 4 and 5 so type 1 and type 2 remember that both can be large diameter um, uh, collagen fibers with striations the difference between the two is the type 1 has more prominent striations and type 2 has less prominent striations type 1 and type 2 both can have large diameter fibers with striations in type 1 it is more prominent in type 2 it is less prominent so type 1 since it is large diameter with prominent striation they are seen in tough structures tendons ligaments aponeurosis dermis of the skin and in meninges type 2 is seen in hyaline cartilage type 3 is the easiest to remember we already classified fibers into collagen fibers reticular fibers and elastic fibers so type 3 is reticular fibers type 4 are short filaments they form sheets more like sheet like structures they are seen in the basement membranes basal basal lamina of basement membrane and the lens capsule and type 5 is seen in blood vessels and fetal membranes so five types of collagen type 1 and type 2 both have large diameters with striations type 1 has prominent and type 2 has less prominent striations type 3 is reserved for reticular fibers type 4 has short filaments that form sheets type 5 is seen in blood vessels and fetal membranes so one now that we are done with collagen fibers next we move to the second one reticular fibers before we go to reticular fibers we go to this diagrammatic representation we saw this rope like structure that was the collagen fiber now look at the reticular fibers just this diagrammatic representation will make you understand what it was we spoke about collagen fibers forming bundles we for, uh, spoke about collagen fibers forming uh, anastomose with uh, anastomosing with other bundles without the individual fibers branching or anastomosing so now when you see the reticular fibers itself you can you will realize that okay here there is something different happening so these are much finer with uneven thickness so much finer with uneven thickness and they network by branching and by anastomosing with each other rather than forming bundles and branching and anastomosing here individual fibers these thin fine fibers start branching and anastomosing with one another the reality of this is it can be easily distinguished from the other fibers and other cells by because it stains black so the upper image here these black structures are nothing but reticular fibers they stay they stain black with silver impregnation so they contain more of carbohydrates than type 1 fibers and they are more often seen in the spleen lymph nodes bone marrow liver and kidney so again see the cord like structure and see these fine um, uh, uneven uh, uh, structures that is the reticular fibers then we come to the third one so again we will go to the diagrammatic like structures where the um, collagen fibers these uh, uneven thin fibers which are intermingled with one another where the Uh, reticular fibers and thin single wavy lines these are not but nothing much nothing but the elastic fibers so these elastic fibers are much fewer compared to the other fibers they are single unlike the collagen as well as the reticular fibers these are single they branch and anastomose with the other fibers again they are produced by fibroblasts by the name itself elastic fibers you know that it can stretch and they are del, uh, digested by the enzymes elastase these elastic fibers have a spe uh, speciality that they don't stain with the normal eosin and hematoxylin stains they need special stains and they are the orsin stain aldehyde fusion stain and weierhaus method of staining and only then they become evident so this is about the elastic fiber they contain elastin they contain the amino acids valine and alanin and they have a special amino acid which is present only in elastic fibers and that is known as desmosin and around this now you can see um, we spoke about the single wavy line that is the elastic fiber 
in the interior of this line is a amorphous core formed by ela by elastin so amorphous the word amorphous means character characterless or shapeless so the center core is characterless or shapeless and is formed by elastin and around the center core of each elastic fiber the center part of it are multiple hair like structures microfilaments and these are known as fibrillin so these are made up of glycoprotein and this is known as gly glycoprotein fibrillin so that is about the elastic fibers so now we discuss about the first component of the connective tissue that is the fibers collagen fibers reticular fibers and elastic fibers next we move on to cells like i told you there are two types of cells fibroblasts undifferentiated mesenchymal cells pigment cells and adipocytes these are residents of connective tissue these are the cells that are present within the connective tissue migrants nris are the macrophage cells the mast cells the lymphocytes plasma cells monocytes and eosinophils which come from somewhere else into the connective tissue when there is a need so we'll move on to the first cell the moment you see it, it is it it hits you it's so evident by looking at it the it looks like a starfish that is nothing but the fibroblast we already have discussed about fibroblast saying that these are the cells which produce the fiber the collagen fibers so these are the most numerous of all cells that are present in the connective tissue they produce all the three types of fibers that is collagen fibers reticular fibers and elastic fibers they are spindle shaped when you see from the side they are spindle shaped with a prominent nucleus when seen from above they are star shaped with a flat nucleus now there are two forms of it inactive form and active form when they are not doing any work when they are resting they are in the inactive form and they are known as fibrocytes and during this inactive form the cytoplasm is very much decreased the number of cells the cell organelles the golgi apparatus the mitochondria they are all in the resting phase in the uh, fibroblast when it is active they become distended with cytoplasm the cytoplasm becomes more and the cell organelles also become more so when do they become uh, active when they have to do some work and what work do these fibroblasts do they help in wound repair how do they help in the wound repair by laying out collagen fibers elastic fibers reticular fibers and giving strength to to the wound so that is the function of the fibroblasts and that is why they are very very important cells there is a group of cells called as myofibroblasts and these are fibroblasts which contains actin and myosin the contractile fibers which are seen in the muscle and hence they are the components of the muscle fibers the smooth muscle fibers undifferentiated then we come to the next set of cells that is the undifferentiated mesenchymal cells the word undifferentiated is important here undifferentiated means these cells are yet to differentiate differentiate into any cell that you want these my mesenchymal cells can become tendon they can become osteo uh, they can form future bone they can form tendon so these are called as mesenchymal cells they are embryonic connective tissue they are stellate small cells star shaped and they branch to form a fine network so these mesenchymal cells if allowed to develop can develop into bone can develop into uh, muscle can develop into tendons then come pigment cells so these are when we talk about pigment cells we talk about brown pigment cells and uh, the pigment that they contain is melanin and where is melanin present of of course you know it is present in the skin it is present in the choroid of the eyes and the iris of the eyeball all the cells which produce melanin are called as melanocytes now we are talking about melanin uh, melanocytes the cells which produce melanin are called as melanocytes but there are also cells which have pigment but these are not the cells which produce the melanin pigment these are the cells near the melanocytes which absorb the melanin pigment and hence get that brown color they are not called as melanocytes melanocytes is the term reserved only for cells that produce melanin so the cells which absorb melanin are known as chromatophores or melanophores so these do not produce melanin they only absorb and get the uh, pigment 
So these prevent the function of pigment cell is they prevent light from reaching other cells. Basically, they protect the other cells, the especially from the ultraviolet rays, the UV rays, from damaging the other cells uh, by uh, coating the brown color pigment there. So it is protects the eyeball and it protects the skin. So that is pigment cell. Next comes the fat cell. The moment you see a fat cell, like I told you. There should be an image that should be imprinted in your mind each time you talk about the cell. Fibroblast, you'll remember a starfish. Uh, pigment cells, you'll see uh, just some undifferentiated, uh, some blobs of brown color there on the slide. The moment you see a fat cell, you should remember a signet ring. You should remember a ring with a diamond on top. So fat cells are also called as adipocytes or lipocytes. When multiple fat cells aggregate together, they form the adipose tissue. This each fat cell contains one big droplet of fat, which tends to occupy the entire part of the fat cell, pushing the nucleus to the periphery. And since the nucleus is pushed, it get also gets flattened. These cells are incapable of division. So fat cells can only accumulate, they can't divide. So you can't blame the body in case you're overweight, you can't blame the body saying that the fat cells are dividing. They are incapable of division. Fat cells can only accumulate. So you can see the adipose cells here. Now, like I told you, keep a diagrammatic representation in your mind. These are the adipose cells. These are the star-shaped fibroblasts. You already know about the cord-like collagen fibers, the reticular fibers, the elastin fibers. Uh, then we'll come to the other cells. So that is about the fat cells. Then come the macrophage cells. So these macrophage cells are also known as histiocytes or plasmatocytes. The main function of these macrophage cells are to eat up. They eat up the bacteria and damaged tissue. And along with that, they also have some immunological activity. There are two types. They can be fixed. They are these uh, macrophage cells can be fixed in one place or free cells which are roaming all around. These fixed macrophages are very similar to fibroblasts. It's very difficult to differentiate them from fibroblasts except when you see at the, uh, look at the nucleus. The other ones are the free. They have a more rounded appearance like this image given here, like this diagrammatic representation given here. So two types of macrophage cells, fixed ones which re uh, resemble fibroblasts, and free macrophages, which, which are rounded in shape. The nuclei of these macrophage cells are kidney-shaped, smaller, and stain more than fibroblasts. And this is what is important when you see under the microscope to differentiate them from fibroblasts. The a structure might be shown to you under the microscope, and they may ask you to identify the structure. Or they may ask you, is it a fibroblast or is it a macrophage. So that time you look at the nucleus, if there is a kidney shaped nucleus, if there is a, a small nucleus which stains more darker compared to the fibroblast, then it is the mast cells. And when these macrophages join together, they can form multinucleated giant cells. So you can see the macrophage cell here interspersed in our collagen tissue. After macrophage cell comes the mast cell. Again, very easy to confuse between the two, but remember that it is uh, the function of both these cells are very different. Where we were talking about histocytes or plasmatocytes, mast cells are known as mastocytes or histaminocytes. If you remember this name that mast cells are also known as histaminocytes, then you'll never forget the function. So these are small round or oval cells. You can see that the nucleus is right in the center, which is small and they contain irregular microvilli. The main, um, uh, the differentiating factor uh, feature of mast cell is that their cytoplasm contains lot of granules. And these granules release histamine. And histamine is very, uh, is, uh, is some, about histamine is something that you always uh, read, uh, uh, hear um, when you uh, talk to your friends somebody is allergic to something. What does it mean that when an antigen has entered the body, this histamine produces an allergic reaction to it. So any allergic reaction 
the cell that is responsible for it is the mast cell. So granules in the cytoplasm, they produce histamine and they are responsible for the allergic reaction in the body. They are seen most around blood vessels and nerves. Next coming to lymphocytes. Now we have to remember again a reminder that lymphocytes, mast cells, macrophage cells are not residents of connective tissue. They are coming to the connective tissue from somewhere else. So these lymphoid tissues are seen, uh, the lymphocytes are seen more in the lymphoid tissue. Their main function is defense mechanism again, against bacteria, against uh, infection. Uh, whenever there is inflammation, these cells increase in number. They are produced in the bone marrow, stem cells in the bone marrow. And there are two types of lymphocytes, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. What is the difference between the two? These B lymphocytes are produced from the stem cells in the bone marrow. They enter directly into the blood and come to the tissues. They enter, come to the tissues wherever there is inflammation. T lymphocytes, on the other hand, are again produced by the stem cells in the bone marrow. They don't go directly into the blood. They instead, they are T lymphocytes. So they go to the thymus, T, T for uh, thymus, T for T lymphocytes. They get activated in the thymus and then they enter the tissue. So that is the difference between B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are directly produced into the bloodstream and they reach the tissues. T lymphocytes, on the other hand, they reach the thymus. From the thymus, they enter the bloodstream and then they produce their action in the tissues. Then we come to the plasma cell. So these are small round basophilic, blue colored. The moment we talk about basophilic, we are saying they are blue colored cells because their cytoplasm stains blue. Their main feature, distinguishing feature is their nucleus, where in the nucleus, there is a, a chromatin, which you can see forms like the spokes of a wheel. It has a typical cartwheel appearance. So this is the distinguishing feature of a plasma cell. The basophil, why is it uh, blue colored? Why is the cytoplasm basophilic? That is because it has abundant rough endoplasmic reticulum. And when there is a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum, it stains blue when it is um, uh, stained with hematoxylin and eosin. The function of the plasma cell is to produce the antibodies. And these antibodies can either go into the system or it can get aggregated within the cell. And when it gets aggregated within the cell, it forms an aggregate of antibodies inside the plasma cells. And these are known as Russell's bodies. So Russell's bodies are nothing but aggregates of antibodies which are produced, uh, which are uh, uh, collected within the plasma cell. Otherwise, they can go into the system and produce its effect. Normally, very few plasma cells are present. Only when there are features of inflammation, the number of plasma cells increase. So now, we finish discussing the we finish discussing the first component that is the fibers collagen fibers reticular fibers elastic fibers then we move on to the cells we discuss the intrinsic component cells and the migrant cells now the structure that is left to discuss to be discussed is the intercellular ground substance the intercellular ground substance is nothing but the transparent homogeneous viscous solution in which the fibers and the cells are uh, interspersed and that is also known as ground substance or matrix the ground substance or matrix so it not, it does nothing but fills the space between the cells and fibers it contains proteoglycans which are nothing but combination of glycous aminoglycans and glycoproteins these are produced by fibroblasts and their main function is to cause adhesions between the fibers as well as the cells. They facilitate additions. So a transparent homogeneous viscous solution, also known as ground substance or matrix, in which the cells and fibers are interspersed and produced by fibroblasts and it facilitates adhesion. So based on the type of glycous aminoglycans, that is the proteoglycans that are present in the ground substance, the different structures are formed. So here we are talking about glycous aminoglycans that are present in various tissues of the body. So tissues can be cartilage, bone, skin, basement membrane and the other structures. So which are the different glycous aminoglycans that you should know the names of? Chondritin sulfate, dermatin sulfate, heparin sulfate, heparin, 
keratin and hyaluronic acid. So you can see, for example, if we take the example of chondroitin sulfate, it is present in the, uh, the connective tissue, the all typical connective tissues, cartilage, bone, skin, not present in basement, membrane, and other structures. Uh, dermatin sulfate is present more in the skin. Dermatin sulfate, the name itself should uh, make you realize that it is present in the skin and it is also present in blood vessels and heart. Heparin sulfate, the moment you think of heparin, we, we heparin and heparin, you think of basement membranes, lungs and well as lung arteries. The hepar uh, heparin is seen in skin and mast cells. Keratin sulfate is seen in cartilage. Keratin, so think of cartilage, cornea, intervertebral disc and hyaluronic acid is seen in typical connective tissue, cartilage, skin and synovial fluid. So these, the based on the glycosaminoglycans present, the different glycosaminoglycans that are present in the ground substance or the matrix in the different structures of the body. So based on this, the connective tissue is now divided into ordinary connective tissue, which can be loose or dense supporting connective tissue that is cartilage and bone and special connective tissue that is elastic connective tissue, reticular connective tissue, mucoid tissue and adipose tissue. So based on the type of connective tissue. Now, how are these uh, based on these types? Based on the nature of the cells, whether cells are more or fibers are more. Based on the nature of fibers, whether collagen fibers are more, reticular fibers are more, elastic fibers are more based on the nature of the ground substance, whether there is abundant ground substance with less number of cells or less ground substance with more number of cells and fibers, they are divided into loose or areolar, connect, loose or dense connective tissue, supporting connective tissue and special connective tissue. So first coming to loose areolar tissue, as the name itself suggests, loose areolar tissue. It is as if in the connective tissue, there is a lot of air present. That means the uh, intercellular the ground substance or the matrix is wide with large spaces and abundant ground substance. Areolae and such tissue is also referred to as areolar tissue. Since it contains large spaces with abundant ground substance with less amount of fi fibers, they can be distorted easily. So that is loose connective tissue. Then it co will obviously come to dense connective tissue. Here, the connective tissue is dense because there is a lot of fibrous tissue. Of course, there is ground substance, but rather than too much of ground substance, here there is too much of fibrous tissue. And when there is a lot of fibrous tissue, the tissue is tougher, unlike the loose uh, areolar connective tissue. So this is white in color. And there are two types, regular and irregular. So it can be regular or irregular. The upper image is that of regular. The lower image is that of irregular based on the orientation of the fiber. So here you can see in the upper image, nice, straight, regular collagen fibers are deposited with nuclei also arranged long, in a uh, longitudinal plane. So that is known as regular dense collagen tissue seen in tendons and durometer of the brain. Second one is irregular. It looks as if the fibers are in all kinds of different directions and that is seen in the dermis sheets of the muscle and nerves. So um, dense collagen connective tissue and loose areolar connective tissue. Then comes to we come to tendons. So we know that the moment there is a lot of connective tissue, which is arranged in a nice, smooth, uh, regular fashion, when it is compressed, a lot of connective tissue is there, they become tough and that leads to the formation of tendons that run parallel to each other. So in longitudinal sections, the fibroblasts and their nuclei, they appear elongated. In the transverse section, they appear star-shaped. So we already saw fibroblasts, they have that star-shaped or uh, stellate-shaped appearance. So in transverse section, they look like this, like stars. In longitudinal session, sections, they look longitudinal with elongated nuclei. So coming to the summary, of connective tissue, we discussed that it contains three types of uh, structures, that is the fibers, cells, as well as the ground substance. All of these contribute to the type of connective tissue and based on the ki kind of connective tissue, it serves different, different purposes in the body. So one is it forms a supportive framework. So bones, when we talk about bones in the body, they form a, a supportive 
framework they have a tough uh, connective tissue movement when there is loose alveolar tissue it facilitate movements of structures above it so the, uh, the connective tissue can also help in movement it forms tight covering for deeper structures as well in tendons they help to transmit the movement from the uh, muscles to the bones so that again is a function of the connective tissue it supports the brain as well as the spinal cord nutrition and insulation you are thinking of a single component of uh, connective tissue that is the adipose cells the adipose tissue not only does the adipose the fat cells give nutrition in cold weather fat cells also provide insulation it protects from the cold we spoke about immunity where we um, the mass the macrophages as well as lymphocytes now we are talking about individual cells they help in immunity wound repair collagen fibers they help in uh, wound healing and fast uh, healing of wounds they prevent the development of hernia in the abdominal muscles by keeping the muscles by running long uh, the by criss crossing of the collagen fibers and keeping it strong and by regeneration as well and it also helps in muscle contractions myofibroblasts which which contain actin and myosin they help in uh, muscle contraction so this in brief is about the connective tissue the different types of connective tissue i will now hand over the stage to dr sanchit and uh, he has some interesting case scenarios based on this connective tissue thank you dr ryan <laughs> it was extremely a brilliant way of uh, doing such a difficult topic because connective tissue is itself very vast it has got so many elements to it and you would probably see in the summary slide itself that it is protecting you it is helping you in movement it is helping you in immunity it is helping you in your day to day uh, you know activities each and everything at each and every place has these kind of substances which are sealing one structure to the other and they are creating a lot of importance right so we straight away move on to the clinical scenarios for today and i would like uh, aishwarya also to come in and if we can have the students participating in as well so they can easily one by one discuss what these case scenarios are because this is the kind of case scenario you will get in a hospital surrounding so now we are inside the hospital we know about connective tissue somewhat we have retained some amount of connective tissue in our brains and now we are going to see the scenarios right so let's have the first scenario and let's see what patient has presented to us okay so case scenario first is about a 17 year old girl who presented with pain in the left hip and difficulty in walking now this girl is been diagnosed with a very strange kind of a disease that is 3a igg lambda multiple myeloma and was treated with a drug called as bortezomib based chemotherapy now this all seems to be i'm just i put this case scenario why because all of these text will be just to just there to confuse you all but the answer remains very simple if you have the logic behind it now the patient showed a good response to this treatment which of the particular cell is expected to be involved pathologically in such patients now if you have carefully understood today what exactly cell do you think is responsible here okay when i'm talking about igg i'll give you a hint here i am talking about antibodies it is a kind of an antibody that is released and this particular antibody is much high in this particular child and because of that she is producing symptoms and that production of such a high antibody level is given the name as multiple myeloma because it is a condition where you have such kind of an antibody titer which releases now if you know which of the following cell releases that antibody you get the right answer can anyone tell the right answer so i think vishal has said sambreen has said lymphocytes okay so can any one of you explain why it is lymphocytes uh vishal uh since vishal answered vishal can we yeah can we can we, can can we, we just answer? have you can vishal be allowed to unmute himself because here itself we'll get a lot of queries solved Vishal, please uh, unmute yourself.
anyone anyone who wants to you know given actually you can try unmuting yourself vishal or even anyone else who would uh, like to answer anyone else anyone just think we are talking about a disease very common multiple myeloma igg okay i have one answer from one anju answer. and it says plasma Kutia cells yeah has answered plasma cells okay so i would straight away go with the right answer the answer is plasma cells now why it is plasma cells and why vishal went wrong here is see see the specificity i am talking about straight away the antibody right if i am talking about an antibody straight away plasma cells produce antibodies right so that is why these kind of diseases have a higher titer of plasma cells okay when i am talking about multiple myeloma there is also a condition which is closely similar it is called as plasma cytoma all of these particular conditions have a very high amount of plasma cells because they are the releasers of antibodies if you if you remember so when it comes to lymphocytes broad term they are b lymphocytes they are t lymphocytes t lymphocytes are not the ones which produce antibodies b lymphocytes are the ones which later on produce plasma cells and that release antibodies right so specifically if i am giving you plasma cells as an option plasma cell would be the right answer so great whoever has answered plasma cell it is the right answer right okay so now we move on to the second scenario of the day okay now we have got another kind of a patient scenario where a 12 year old boy complains of constant episodes of itching in the eyes sneezing and running nose he is diagnosed to have been suffering from allergic rhinitis that is nothing but allergic uh, inflammation of the nasal cavity and sinuses and it is prescribed and the person is prescribed with an antihistaminic to relieve the symptoms now we every day have these kind of antihistamines like we take cetirizine or we take fexofenadine and we tend to have these resolved of symptoms right which of the following cell you think will be targeted to relieve these symptoms think think histaminic okay antihistaminic will be against which cell we have samreen answering we have pratik answering okay one person has told histiocytes one person has told mast cells okay anyone else wants to add on again rudina has answered histiocytes okay now okay again anjum has answered mast cells so i have 50% of the population towards mast cells 50% towards histiocytes now again i'll go back and recap what ryan sir told you histio means tissue sites means cells correct so when they are inside when they are called as histiocytes histiocytes we are talking about macrophages macrophages are called as histiocytes or plasmatocytes that's what ryan sir told you right when i'm talking about mast cells these are basically the histamine releasers so always remember when it comes to mast the word itself has got histamine granules inside it these histamine granules are the ones which release histamine okay so th see see this diagram now you remember mastocytes histaminocytes they have these histamine granules now in these kind of situations when you have got an allergic kind of a reaction mast cells are the ones which are going to be the first ones to be releasing histamine histamine will produce allergic symptoms when i talk about macrophages see this these are antigen eaters if suppose the bacteria comes inside the body suppose any foreign substance comes inside the body who is your first line of defense macrophage these will go there they will eat up that bacteria and they will generate an immune response inside your body that you will later understand when you read immunity but the first line of defense and antigen eaters that is why they have a very big role in immunological activity right so the word itself is mentioned there they eat up bacteria they eat up damaged things right so remember this name histiocytes for antigen eating mast cells for histamine release okay so in this particular scenario what we discussed can we have the scenario so in this particular scenario whoever has answered histamine related things that is from mast cells so mast cells is the right answer right so don't get confused in it now i think it would be clear right between everyone okay now we move on to the third scenario see that is why we have kept scenarios so that you can get a idea where these cells actually come into okay now you must have seen ryan sir showing you one particular picture okay so let's look under the microscope and i have taken out a specimen of a tumor that a person was suffering from lipoma and this particular lipoma was just 
uh, sectioned under the microscope and viewed and we found which type of cell in this view macrophage mast cell plasma cell or an adipocyte somebody has answered samreen has answered adipocyte sir okay so uh, samreen can you tell me two important features what makes you think this is an adipocyte samreen you can unmute yourself voice access is given to everyone please try unmuting yourself um, can you hear me uh, a little louder dear uh, how about now yeah yeah yes, yes. we can hear you yeah uh, because the nucleus is flattened and great it has the fat droplet great it is eccentric and flat okay nucleus is eccentric what do you mean by eccentric it is towards the edge right so it is towards the edge plus it is flat and it has got as you told it has got that kind of a space in between so you see many 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 spaces right this is a characteristic of a lipomatous cell so see this is what exactly is there you can see the lacunae or the fat droplet containing the space and you have a one sided nucleus which has been pushed away and it has become flat right so this is a characteristic of a lipocyte or an adipocyte and if i confuse you with lipoma it is nothing but a fat tumor it is nothing but fat globules collected together forming a benign tumor right so don't get confused with such scenarios okay now let's come to case case scenario number 4 right 15 year old boy complained of throat pain and fever he happened to eat ice cream the previous night since when he developed these symptoms in order to engulf the pathogen from the ice cream and generate an immune response which of the following cell will predominantly play a role again i use the term engulf the pathogen plasma cell lymphocytes mast cells and macrophages now think think what i told you so any Sambhi answer please answer it pratik has answered okay so again so there is again one confusion anju mast cells i told you it is always remember histamine okay macrophages remember engulfing pathogens okay so when it comes to immunity always remember don't get confused macrophages 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 lymphocytes and macrophages are the only two cells which play the maximum role in immunity in which the first line defense always is formed by macrophages so remember macrophages don't make this mistake right whenever it comes to mast cell remember histamine 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 so mast cell will release histamine histamine will create allergy macrophage will engulf the pathogen create an immune response okay simple as that so don't get confused when this scenario has been given to you they are asking about some bacteria might have entered because of that ice cream that bacteria went through the throat macrophages are present in the tissues they would have engulfed that bacteria and generated an immune response and that is why she is suffering from signs of inflammation throat pain and fever correct so don't confuse with these scenarios it's as simple as that they are just there to mix you and waste your time it is very very simple if you have the correct idea about the chapter right now we move on to the next scenario okay now find the correct statement out of the this is one of the commonest questions that has been asked and we have taken this question in the previous year that has been asked in your uh, neat entrances so this is one of the very common question that has been repeated again and again areola tissue is a loose connective tissue tendon is specialized connective tissue cartilage is a loose connective tissue and adipo adipose tissue is a dense connective tissue so which of the following uh, statements you feel is correct so we have options so i think everyone is agreeing to the first one right yes so sir. anyone for any other option i think everybody has answered a correct yeah, a I'm is absolutely sure. just remember loose areolar connective tissue right the name itself says the same thing right loose why because it has been loosely there there's so much of space between in this connective tissue and as rancer said there's a lot of space there's a lot of lacunae in between this tissue that is why it is given the name as loose areolar connective tissue right so it is an ordinary connective tissue it doesn't have any kind of a special function because it is loosely arranged and that is the reason it has been given the name like that right so always remember out of those correct statements loose areolar connective tissue forms the most important right okay now let's come to another one next scenario next scenario is again now this these the coming question and this question is the one which you need to memorize silver stain is there to specifically demonstrate which of the following fibers now we told you one fiber and if you have carefully understood one person will actually come out with the right answer silver is for what 
So Ranser told you about silver impregnation. That is, if this particular fiber will take silver, it will stain black. Correct? Somebody has answered. Which fiber will take it? Samarin reticular. Samarin has answered. Reticular fibers. Anyone for any other answer? Reticular fiber, even for Pratik. Okay, so reticular fibers is the right answer. Always remember how I used to remember is see the silver ends with R and S starts with silver. So the silver word starts with S, ends with R. So the ending is R. So remember reticular starting is S, so silver. So silver is always for reticular fibers. Remember it like that because this usually gives you a kind of you know when you uh, uh, you get confused between these terms. So silver impregnation test staining of black. that is done by reticular fibers right now can anyone tell me okay out of everyone there in the group can anyone tell me if we stain collagen which is a particular stain collagen takes you have seen that color of light pink what is the stain that collagen gives can anyone tell that you seen so many pink and blue i always told you that you have to remember two dyes in the last class also correct right so it is h and e staining hematoxylin and eosin staining right summary so that is why it appears to be pink right they have these bundles which stain pink with h and e right okay so now you know what h and e stains now you know what silver stains and now we'll move on to the next question which is related to this scenario and what does or seen stain what is this particular stain used for mast cells elastic fibers reticular or collagen so we told you about one more stain with this orsin stain it was a very small line but correct so samreen is right again orsin is a particular stain which is used for elastic fibers can anyone in the class tell me another dye that can stain that one more name of a dye which stains other than orsin somebody remembers it starts with a aldehyde fusion aldehyde fusion as well ha huh, correct summary so aldehyde fusion as well as if you remember or seen it's enough for you so these are the ones which classically stain elastic fibers okay silver again reticular fibers elastic fibers aldehyde fusion or seen okay these are the general you know uh, questions which you can get in your mcq batch right what stains what because these are the things that you need to revise again and again and remember but if you know the idea first you know you need to understand then you need to memorize right okay now we move on to the next scenario that is case scenario number 8 you find this child entering inside the opd okay and again there is a scenario that this 5 year old child is diagnosed to have down syndrome this is a particular type of genetic uh, disease uh, not a disease it's a syndrome right and the child presented to the pediatric opd with symptoms of recurrent infections and fever so the mother is telling that again and again my child is unwell again and again the child develops fever and infection a bad throat sometimes stomach infections sometimes urinary infection so she is very worried the mother is quite concerned about the child and asks the doctor why is my baby falling sick again and again and again and again is the word here so the doctor explains to the mother that such children of down syndrome have some kind of thymic abnormalities now thymus is a gland that is present in everyone and this gland has a specific function i'm not going to tell that that later on i'll get once you get me the answer okay so this gland has some kind of abnormalities in these children which affect one type of cell that this particular gland creates and that is why the immunity of the child is falling again and again now can you name me the cell what this child would be suffering from so pratik and samreen have told t cells anybody wants to attempt this other than them wants to go ahead vinayak has told b cells anyone else so we have b cells we have t cells anyone else anyone for mast cell anyone for macrophages vinayana also has told t cells i think vinayak is with b cells i think rest of everyone is with t cells when i do you want to change the answer to t 
or you want to stick with B, or other people want to change from T to B, or any other option as as here. Okay, so I think uh, everybody is done with their answers. Thinking now, think of this particular baby. Okay, thymus is a gland. What is the function of thymus? Thymus basically is present just to regulate or differentiate the amount of T cells. So, as Ryan has already told you, B cells and T cells are basically types of lymphocytes. These are produced by our bone marrow. Now, bone marrow releases B lymphocytes and they directly go into the tissues. Right, but T cells don't directly go. They first go to the thymus, and T cells in the thymus are naive. They don't know how to function, so they differentiate there. That means T cell become mature there, and they have a specific role after maturing. After these entering into the thymus, once they differentiate or they become mature, then they are released into the specific tissues according to the role they have to play. Some T cells eat; they are called as cytotoxic. Some T cells help; they are called as helper T cells. Right, so they have specific functions after they exit out from the thymus. People from Down syndrome or this anomaly, as we have stated, have this kind of a hypoplastic thymus. That means their thymus is not very well formed, and that is the reason these people cannot make these mature T cells very well. Now, when these T cells won't mature, won't get formed, what will happen? They will finally go, but they don't know their function. so they won't be able to give you a good immune response and that is why these children again and again keep falling sick they keep coming with uh, such kind of infections and that is the major concern so we have to give them uh, again and again we have to reassure the mother and we have to keep giving treatments to such children for recurrent infections fine so all so whatever whoever is answered t cells absolutely right brilliant answer just the thought behind it i have already explained you okay always remember that So how these function, right? Now we'll move on to the ninth scenario, the second last for today. This is an easy one. So which of the following connective tissue connect? So you've seen one thing as a muscle, the other thing as a bone. So you name me the thing that is connecting the muscle to the bone. What is that called as? It is called as loose areolar tissue. It is called as tendon, cartilage, or ground substance. What is that called as? Okay, so fast answers B. So a tendon. Tendon is the right answer. Okay. tendon are connectors of a muscle to a bone so wherever you find these kind of ten tendons suppose somebody is telling you biceps tendon always remember biceps tendon is a tendon that is connecting the biceps muscle to its insertion point right so tendon will be the one which will come everywhere you see achilles tendon let's say so what is what is that tendon it is present in the foot and it is connecting one muscle right to a bone so wherever the tendon comes that is a connector between muscle and bone this is a very common question don't make mistakes in this so it will be frequently asked to you right fine so we'll move on to the next scenario straight away ninth scenario the ground substance of connective tissue is formed of now carefully think and answer me ground substance is something that is present as already ranser brilliantly explained to you as a bucket or filled filled with water right so that bucket whatever you put inside the bucket the ground substance is going to take that so that water is a ground substance so what is what it is made about phospholipids lipids monosaccharides mucopolysaccharides somebody has answered mucopolysaccharides anyone for anything else rudayna also for d anything any anyone again prateek is d so i think everybody is happy with mucopolysaccharides right so answer is right mucopolysaccharides is absolutely the right answer all these interesting terms that we told about heparin sulfate dermatin sulfate these are all glycosaminoglycans gags right glycosaminoglycans are all basically formally known as mucopolysaccharides remember that so they can confuse you with that so mucopolysaccharides are everything whatever these these gags formally are called as mucopolysaccharides so you can even get a question like that just to confuse you right so this ground substance has a lot of these glucosaminoglycans and on the basis of that glucosaminoglycan we have got different different types of again connective tissues that how much connective tissue contains this particular type of glucosaminoglycan or this particular type of glucosaminoglycan is present in what and what not so this is also one of the commonly asked questions to you right okay now we move on to the days last scenario that is again scenario number 10 and this is again to again confuse you cartilage contains all of the following gags that is glycosaminoglycans except one chondroitin sulfate keratin sulfate hyaluronic acid or heparin sulfate again to confuse you okay 
can you even tell me what is not there so again anjuman stone told d it's quite fast other other people anyone wants to go for any other option okay so answer is d absolutely right remember cartilage is something hard right chondroitin chondro means cartilage that has to be there so chondroitin sulfate is definitely there second it has to have something which is also there in order to make it more hard keratin means keratin like okay so that is something which will make hard so keratin sulfate is another constituent and if you see hyaluronic acid hyaluronic acid always remember it is always found in typical connective tissues which are hard like skin okay skin is quite hard like cartilage it is present in the cartilage also so hyaluronic acid keratin as well as chondroitin they all three constitute the cartilage what is not seen inside is heparin sulfate now heparin word seems like heparin heparin is something that is related to blood mostly right that was that also we give as a blood thinner so you can remember something that is inside the arteries okay so heparin sulfate is seen mostly in the arterial point of view or the arteries correct so remember things like this you can make things easier for yourself remember like this so you will be easily you know understanding now here itself i'll add one more thing heparin sulfate is seen solely in one particular tissue can you tell me heparin sulfate is only seen in only one tissue so remember basement membrane this is also one of the most commonly asked uh, uh, scenarios in your neat so this has also been a question cartilage has been a question basement membrane has been a question as what they contain and what they do not contain so it can come topsy turvy and it can uh, often can confuse you with such questions okay so i think this would be the end of the case scenario session so i hope you guys have enjoyed it and uh, i hope you can now at least think of these things before you know attempting these questions so don't get confused with big big things that are asked to you that is the logic behind it so when we talk about in polaris 2 we don't try to go into the complex scenarios that's why we are not going into it whenever we see a question you are going to face only case scenario based questions so when you are facing these case scenario based questions as soon as i see such a big thing down syndrome and this and that it makes a you know a very big impact on me that if i don't know this particular disease so i am not going to attempt this question at all but finally even if you don't know that disease you can still attempt it by knowing the data behind it if you know the data you can actually predict that you know this disease i might not know but something like this i can understand and i can keep it okay so don't forget such kind of scenarios build you up okay so whoever is answered today brilliant guys and uh, thank you for participating thank you for such a lovely uh, evening and ryan sir thank you so much for such a brilliant uh, webinar on connective tissue over to you thank you sanchit uh, as usual uh, you are uh, one of the best quiz masters and uh, you really not only make it entertaining you may, uh, not only make it very edu educative you make it very entertaining as well so i hope our uh, session for today was uh, uh, good for the students i think we'll hand it over to dr aishwarya now no doubt on that sir like the slide says they keep reading keep listening and keep shining i'm very sure on that and uh, as usual the the whole session starting from ryan sir and ending up with the q and a with sanjit sir it went really well and to be very frank i personally got to know a lot of things which i didn't know or maybe i forgot ever since my first year and thank you so much uh, for that personally from my side as well and i feel my dear students also would have got it really well Uh, right guys do you agree with me can i see it in the comment section did you, did it uh, really gave you a lot of insights yes i can see a lot of them saying yes ma'am <laughs> thank you so much this makes our day thank right you. thanks sir and sanjit sir yes 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 okay so eagerly waiting to see all of you guys for the very next session which is happening on wednesday and uh, thank you so much for uh, being here today and uh, you know competitively answering every questions we will come up on wednesday again sharp at 6:30 until then yeah, um, we, can, we can tell them the uh, topic also so they might be they can come read and you know they can also listen to us 
So it would be really beneficial to them. So we'll be discussing about skin and fascia. So, okay. so we can share that, and uh, we would be yeah. we would love to have a participation from the students as well. Yeah. So basically, the next topic, as uh, Ryan sir rightly told, it will be on uh, skin and fascia. Uh, uh, you know, the superficial fascia, deep fascia, the modifications of deep fascia, all these things in detail. Okay, so just take a look at your textbooks, whatever is there with you, and then come to the class sharp at six thirty on Wednesday with a yet another rock session from our dear sirs. Until then, it's bye from all three of us. Thank you so much, and have a nice day.